black area is developer, developer area. And black area here, which is hard, very difficult to actually see, this is developed area of Hong Kong, with the same population and the area of one third smaller. Which leads occasionally to overcrowding and also leads to people borrowing the space, borrowing the space from the street by creating illegal extension. And borrowing the space from the street for creating, um, well, for advertising. Or borrowing space roof for bringing some landscape to the city or additional housing units. Um, landscape and especially trees, this tree here actually is growing from the gutter. The roots start somewhere here. And you can see a beautiful tree trying to borrow the space of this one. So the question is whether Hong Kong actually reached its um, extreme or not. Um, and I think the answer is that we are far away, far, far away from actually reaching the extreme and we could do much more. What I'm going to show next is just some student project done last year when we tried to intensify the land use. Um, in here, obviously, the first picture shows a desire of most Hong Kong people, the desire to have some greenery outside the window. Desire to have some greenery outside the window leads to creating a leg illegal extension to support the plants. But Hong Kong people being economical use water from air conditioner in the blue bucket instead of dripping all the way on people's ha uh, heads and that is illegal. You collect the water and you basically use it for watering your plants. So what could be done in the future? Well, in the future we could use the water from maybe air conditioning for much, much bigger scale. We could use it maybe for hydroponics. And if we look at the south facing elevation in Hong Kong, they could have, well, this is very simplistic, you could have a greenery in this case, the greenery of soya bean. Now, the soya bean could actually grow on a conveyor belt with, um, which moves, moves very, very slowly. So the plants start growing here, and they go full circle all the way up, and they harvest it right at the top. In order to protect them at the top, because the wind is quite strong at the top of the building, there is additional protection screen right at the top. But, <coughs> like that. The water is collected from the rainwater, from the air conditioning, and the grade water. So all that mixed, similar to that case, it will feed the growth. But that is not enough. Then the soya beams is processed in a spare space in a suspended ceiling. And as it goes down, it turns into the biodiesel. And the biodiesel is fed to the minibuses and taxis and the buses in Hong Kong. So year 2020, well, maybe growing soya beam on elevation, we could do a little bit more. Maybe we could use the space in between the advertising. We know that nowadays you can use artificial light for growing the beans. So the soya beam could grow 24 hours a day and be harvested by just dropping the thing down. This is a detailed drawing. 
year 2020-2025. Well, maybe one child could look like that. Maybe everybody will be growing in terms of hydroponics, the plants which could be arranged differently for different use, for protection from the sun or for just decoration or just a bar, maybe noise barrier. But maybe the mixed use development, again, we could push it a little bit f forward. And instead of saying mixed development, we could start and think about compound development. Compound when elements are joined and separation is difficult. In the mixed development, all the kind of elements still remain some kind of identity and they're easy to s separate. In this case, they basically totally mixed. So the mixed development becomes compound development and basically what might happen in the future, in 2020 or 2050, that we start designing the agriculture together with the buildings. So the buildings might very much change their form and the way we use the land. And maybe next time we invite it here, we won't be talking about dim sum city, we'll be talking about soya city. Um, my presentation is going to follow on from Justina's and it's going to be in two parts, Integrated Networks and 3D Dim Sum City. Again, I'm looking at the theme of vertical stacking. Um, Hong Kong can be understood, I think the structure of Hong Kong can be understood as a series of integrated, very intensely integrated networks and I'll go on to show you um, some of those. And that's at the macro scale, more at the structural scale of the city. Um, but at the micro scale, these intense networks, when they meet, they create um, very, very intense 3D hubs of stacked programs. Um, this form of the city of uh, contemporary Hong Kong of well-defined and intense infrastructure connections and uh, very intense nodes can actually um, be extended outwards to the Pearl River Delta as well. The pink patch on the right hand side is Hong Kong Island and the big yellow area is the Pearl R River Delta in uh, Guangdong province. And I think as many people have heard uh, Rem Kuhas talk about this region um, becoming and functioning more and more like one mega city of um, close to 40 million people by 2010. One way to alleviate density and to stop the city from coming up, have a good transport, public transport system. Hong Kong's got very, very low uh, car ownership. A very wide range of modes of public transport, bridges, tunnels, um, elevated highways, trains, undergrounds, ferries. But the point I want to make is that there are a lot of these networks, and these networks, there are a lot of these networks crossing. Um, when I presented in China uh, two years ago, uh, the American presenters and the European presenters were very, very surprised at the level of interconnection of these transport nodes. And I think that's what makes the public transport system in Hong Kong um, very effective, not only for the people, but also for the way that buildings are developed and planning has evolved. This is a, a plan of the Central Business District. As Justina said, it's a little under um, one kilometer in length. And all the black and blue lines that you see there are actually um, walkways, pedestrian walkways connecting um, all of the buildings in the Central District above and below ground. So it is actually possible to cover, to walk across the whole central business district without even
touching the ground. As you can see in the image, um, we have a lot of elevated uh, walkways, some four stories high, as uh, Justina has showed you. So it's actually very interesting that um, street life has been completely inter internalized. This also happens to public transport. Um, cars and trains used to be on the ground, but in Hong Kong they go underground and they go above ground as well, through mountains and <coughs> up mountains. So we have to negotiate the complex topography, uh, multi-layered uh, transport systems are very common in Hong Kong. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces of architecture in Hong Kong. It's an outdoor escalator system. It's one kilometer long, uh, only two meters wide, and it carries, um, according to some estimates, close to 72,000 people per day, which, as uh, Winston is going to tell you, is very close, uh, more or less, about the same as traffic as Hong Kong Airport, same time kind of uh, human traffic. Um, and this, you might have seen this, uh, this escalator in some movies, it actually touches buildings. The closest point is probably less than a meter away from people's windows, and it snakes up a uh, very steep terrain um, from central district up to the mid-levels residential district. It's 24 hours operational, and sometimes it's static, sometimes it's mobile. And what's really interesting um, that the government hadn't planned when they built this escalator, because originally they just planned it as a form of transport, is that there's a whole urban street culture that's evolved around this escalator now. Clubs, eateries, um, actually people hanging out um, on the escalator system and around the escalator system. So it's, it's a very vibrant um, uh, space in, in, in the middle of the city of Hong Kong. But it's also infrastructure. As I said at the beginning, this complex web and interconnections of uh, uh, infrastructure actually was designed to support development. That is the way that the government thinks, and that's the way the city has evolved. So within this um, image here, this is the central business district, um, within a very, very tight area, we've got ferries, we've got an airport uh, train connection, we've got the underground underneath, we've got a bus stop. The stock exchange of Hong Kong is actually an air rights slice that has just been slotted into this building on top of a bus stop. It's, they built the bus stop and then they just slotted in the, the stock exchange. And then here you have uh, ferries, hydrofoils, you know, and so on, trams, all within more or less a three to five minute walk. So this is what I mean by intense connections. A lot of different modes of transport uh, meeting at particular points and that actually allows um, like it or, or, or hate it, developments like this to, to evolve above the transport stations. So actually when the government plans, they, don't only, they not only plan the, the transport, they plan everything else above that as well. They expect stuff to happen on top of that. And this is the way that uh, the city has evolved over the past um, 10 to 20 years. There's been a huge amount of uh, spending on infrastructure. Um, but very interestingly, like the escalator, these uh, intersections of transport have become more than just stations. They've become urban attractors. They've become social condensers. I mean, for example, this. This is a, this is a hydrofoil uh, terminal that is operational 24 hours a day, takes you to Macau and different places nearby. And it, inside, there's a huge um, open plaza, which is open 24 hours a day and it's busy 24 hours a day. So again, um, in Hong Kong, we have quite an extreme situation of interiorizing um, what is commonly known or commonly experienced as external space uh, elsewhere. The dim sum uh, analogy again. Uh, this is a product designed by Gary Chang of Edge, who was supposed to be here. He was our uh, team leader, and he couldn't be here for various reasons, but I'd just like to show this project of his. It's actually a tea set that can actually be reconfigured like the, the dim sum baskets in different ways. So, diff so instead of configuring um, a Chinese tea set traditionally in a horizontal, planar kind of arrangement, Gary's decided that 
to reflect the, the lifestyle or the way that Hong Kong people think, he's actually designed a tea set that is vertically stacked and that can be reconfigured in any um, combination, except for the crown maybe. Right, um, I'm gonna now talk about a series of uh, stackable uh, projects, some real and some theoretical. Transport as a 3D stackable city. This is uh, the central airport express, is where you, it's the station where you come in um, from the airport. And on top of this station, there is planned uh, hotel, retail, office, uh, park, plaza, stock exchange, and, and so on. And um, right next to a, a series of uh, ferry terminals. Designed by Arab Associates uh, from, from London. It's a series of layers of different uh, check-in counters and uh, station facilities, baggage facilities. And on top of that, obviously, you saw, you saw the tower. So it's a multi-level uh, station where even the trains are multi-level. Immigration as 3D stackable city. This is the low Wu border crossing between the Hong Kong side and the Shenzhen side. And it's basically where the train comes from Hong Kong, enters an immigration building. You get off and you enter this kind of 3D maze of immigration as you go um, across the border. You go up and down. Apparently, um, non-Hong Kong people go underground and uh, Hong Kong people go above ground and you enter the Shenzhen side straight into a incredible um, web of stacked programs again. They call this Low Wu uh, commercial city, which is again everything. You can buy uh, counterfeit goods there, you can get your teeth fixed by illegal dentists, you can buy a rabbit on the way home, you can buy, you know, any, basically anything is for sale. Um, they have hotels here and they have a train station that takes you to um, other parts of Guangdong province. So it's incredible um, uh, uh, stacking of uh, different programs at this immigration point. As you can he see here in the section. Um, and like uh, the central picture I showed you, they also have a bus stop with this um, commercial city on top. And that's the immigration building that you have to go up and down. This is a new one. Um, Im uh, immigration points not enough, apparently, because there's a lot of traffic. And this is, this is the new um, border crossing, which will be 24 hours, which they are going to build uh, quite soon. It's actually a suspension bridge in between the Hong Kong side and the uh, Shenzhen side. But as you can see, again, it's a very um, 3D kind of development. Shopping is uh, stacking. I'm not going to talk about this one too much, but Justina has said. Uh, this is Festival Walk designed by uh, Architectonica. It's, I think it's six layers of uh, uh, retail on top of um, an MTR station, the crossing between, between the, the tube station and the rail network. As you can see here, the rail network and the MTR crossing. And what's really interesting about this is that after this development came about, other developments gravitated towards this hub, which was traditionally very residential. And now there's even a university there and an office tower on top. So stations have become massive uh, attractors of, um, of density and of different um, urban activities. This is a competition entry um, that I did with uh, some other AA friends of mine uh, in Hong Kong. It's a youth center, it's a community youth center and it's a stacking of probably about 15 or 15 or 16 programs, including uh, street markets, retail, performance spaces, film studio, high-tech incubator, uh, dance studio, um, offices, uh, what else? Um, something to do with uh, technology here, and then finally on top, this giant uh, uh, louvered um, hostel, which is hanging in the in the sky. Some sections showing this, showing you the scheme. So this is all the stacking of programs as you go up. Um, and the concept 
really for this project was because it's connected to an MTR station, to a, to a tube stop, and to a lot of uh, res residential development, our concept was to really extend the tube stop, the, st the surface of the tube stop or the street of the uh, surrounding um, residential environment and meld them together and continue that street all the way up as a continuous street that goes all the way up to the hostels. Some night views. Um, there's an elevated plaza about 16 stories above ground. The whole development's about 30 something stories high. Um, some student work. I think one of the most uh, famous stacked programs of all time, one of my all time favorites, is the Kowloon Wall City. Um, 10 to 14 stories. This is now demolished now, but 10 to 14 stories containing 35,000 people in uh, 2.7 hectares. At one point it was the densest place on, on the planet. Um, that's a cross-section uh, done by I think a Japanese professor. It's now demolished and one of my students uh, last year uh, dis uh, did a project that actually used an algorithmic process to generate um, the kind of intensity and the kind of mixtures of stack programs as the Kowloon Wall City, but applying current building regulations and current um, standards of density to see what would happen. So this is a kind of process from nothing. Slowly, it grows again. And um, this is the roof plan, some typical uh, units with uh, all kinds of different users. This is the elevation. Um, this is not the final result. This is just T plus maybe 35 in a series of generations. And this is a sort of model that ref reflected that, uh, that plan and that elevation. Some more student work. Um, landscape can also be stacked. This was a project that actually tried to deal with a lack of landscape in new towns in, uh, in Hong Kong. And this project was trying to weave different layers of landscapes, stacked landscapes, back into um, very dense uh, uh, public housing. As you can see, sort of stacked layers again woven with uh, different qualities. Um, the reverse of that, can landscape, well the, well, the, the last project was landscape um, invading uh, urban development, and this one is the reversal of that, because, as Justina said, 70% of Hong Kong is landscape, and what the government typically typically does in Hong Kong is they cut mountains and they dump the mountains into the harbour to reclaim that, and then they build on top of that. But um, this project actually tries to um, argue against that, saying, why do we actually need to dump the uh, the cut mountains? Why don't we just scoop out the mountain and build into the mountain. So this was actually the city invading um, the landscape. And how many layers here? 14 layers. Uh, basically, it's a mountain. It's a mountain city. 14 layers of 24-hour um, mixed-use program. It's like a mini community um, that decides to uh, migrate to a mountain. Its, uh, colors are representing different programs stacked up within this mountain. And finally, just want to show you, um, this is a real project that is a uh, work in progress, um, started by Terry Farrell, who did the master plan. This is West Kowloon, uh, right on the uh, waterfront. And uh, this is how Terry Farrell conceived of, it's actually above, um, what's interesting about it is that it's above a one kilometer long uh, airport express uh, train station as well. So his, his idea was really to build, again, um, a mini station city above that station. So as in the Hong Kong station example, you've got one, two, three, four, five layers of station and a very, very big park before you get the sort of very um, predictable kind of uh, Hong Kong style urban development and a sort of rocket tower. Um, but what's really interesting that about this is that since this has happened, this is actually on site and, and under construction, the government has reclaimed uh, the part of the, the bit of land in front of that and has declared that this will be 
Hong Kong's new cultural district. And there was an enormous uh, international competition, some of you may have uh, entered, um, to actually uh, make this into um, a hub for performances, uh, leisure, parks, uh, shopping, if you can call that leisure, and, and other activities. And um, this is the final result. This is the winner, uh, Lord Foster, with his scheme. It's a giant uh, glass dome over the whole development and uh, layers of different cultural activities under underneath this uh, giant glass dome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was being asked to do a talk on Asia, uh, we thought there must be a lot of phenomena in Asia which are now very well described over the last two days. So what I'm going to do is to use some of those practical experience that we faced as practicing architects. Uh, what these phenomenal events mean to us. When we talk about transportation and movement of people, one of the uh, most uh, interesting phenomena is the amount of movements you actually get. When Lawrence talked about the escalator in Hong Kong, which is one kilometer long, serving only one part of Hong Kong, which is the central and central mid-level, you're talking about a movement of 72,000 people a day, which is roughly over the period of the time that the escalator is open, means it's about 7,500 people per hour. And that, in terms of transportation, is the same design capacity as the Hong Kong International Airport. This building was opened in 1998, after six years from design to construction to practical opening to final opening. The building is one and a half kilometers long and it served only 45 aircrafts parked at the terminal simultaneously. And if you looked at the most of Hong Kong, the developments are always stacked. Like everybody was saying, it's stacked vertically. Well, this building is as flat as a pancake. And it's only four story high. But yet, it's the, uh, the transportation that goes into this building not only try to bring you from the very furthest aircraft stands to the terminal building, it has its own underground system, it has its own escalator system, it has its own shops, offices, hospital within the terminal building. It is a city all unto itself. And when you looked at Hong Kong geographically in its relationship to its neighbor, Hong Kong is a city of only six and a half million people. But yet, it has, its airport is designed to, for 85 million passengers per year. So where are these people come from? Looking at Hong Kong in its position, the airport is designed as a hub. There are all these hub airports surrounding Hong Kong within a four and a half hours flight time. To the north is Beijing, Seoul, Osaka, Tokyo, Shanghai, Taipei, Manila, Ho Chi Minh, Bangkok, KL, Singapore, and the furthest to the west is Delhi. All these hub airports are now being developed or already built. If they are already built, they are now going into the second phase. Some of them are even going into the third phase. If you think this is phenomenal, we've set up our practice in 1999 after finishing the Hong Kong airport. We have been so busy with airport projects since in the last five years, we worked on five airports, one a year. The very first one, not all of them are competition, is Xi'an Airport. It was designed by the, uh, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority uh, Architectural Department in Beijing. But because the design was so Chinese or local, uh, they thought it needed someone to give it a, an image. So we helped them to develop that concept and give it an international feel, which is a very common term you get in China. After that project, we got invited to do four more. 
uh, Qingdao, which is an invited competition for seven architects internationally. We didn't win, we came second. And then after that, we were invited to do Jinan, which is only one hour flight time from Beijing. And this we won, and the project is now almost completed. The third one is, uh, the fourth one is Dalian, which we also won in a competition. Uh, we're against seven other architects internationally. And then after that, Beijing, International Airport, again an international competition. And then Shanghai, most recently, we just submitted about two months ago. These airports are small and large. The regional airport, we are talking about 60 million, uh, 60,000 square meter per unit, handling about five to seven million passengers per year, up to the largest, such as Shanghai, which is already phase two to the Pudong Airport, for the old Pudong Airport, which is completed only in 1999. So we are already talking about expanding, doubling its capacity after only three years. So there must be something wrong with the planning or the, uh, the, the traffic forecast. That's because China has always been very conservative in its way of developing infrastructures, quite unlike Hong Kong. Hong Kong likes to look at things far in advance. China look at infrastructure investment every five years. So if you think these five airports or six airports in five years is, is a very fast pace, imagine there are 98 airports yet to be built in China in the next five years. So we've got plenty of work to come, but that's not all good news because working in such an environment usually means you do have to sacrifice. This project, when we, after we won the competition, it came no surprise to us that originally the project was destined for a local Chinese institute to win it. But because our design was so much better and so much different from theirs, the mayor chose ours. So the, the client was very, very devious. They wanted us and wrote into our design contract that we must finish preliminary design from a competition within three months and that is within three months of his appointment letter. And it took us a month and a half to agree the terms of that contract, and therefore we only left with one and a half months to finish the design. Not only that, we won't get paid if in the preliminary design approval process that we get rejected. So in other words, you, your fee is tied to a performance which you can't guarantee. So from a practicing architect point of view, if I were under the RIBA rule, I say forget it. it, it can't be done. But in China, you have to do it, otherwise you never get another job. So we have to stick our neck out and say, okay, we'll do it in one and a half months. And we did, we actually did it in just a week, less than one and a half months. What it means is that in China, because you are un working against a lot of the tides of uh, change and also the speed of development that are happening, often architects have to work in f extremely difficult situation and you really have to um, you know, stick with the problem and get on with it. The approval process took 106 experts sitting in a room like this and we have to present one at a time to each one of them. Luckily, we got approved within one and a half days of presentation, and that was approved in one go. So we got all our fee. Now, the project is not uh, a simple building like most, uh, most uh, development concrete frame building. The structure, the building is 60,000 square meters, but the roof structure is part of a toroid in which both sides of the roof assembly a, uh, a bird's in flight. Actually, it's a 950 meter rolling radius and 185 rolling radius in the other direction, making the roof actually a, a, a single curvature or two cycle curvature, but constant at least, so that assembly and prefabrication makes possible. And when you look at a structure like that, the span is a 120 meter, a 100 meter span from column to column without any support system, in, in intermediate support. And the smallest span is 30 meters. And the column centers are 30 meters primary and the secondary beams are at 50 meters. We are not talking about a very simple building. It's a very highly engineered building. 
So even though we finished preliminary design in one and a half months, the construction documents finished in three months, and the building got built in two years. Now, in a building like that, which I worked on, like Stansted, I started in 1981, didn't finish until 1991, 10 years. This is done in three. So if you use the normal sort of standard to judge the pace of development in China, it is a totally different world. We learn our lessons and we have to learn it fast because we have just been given the fit out contract to do the terminal. And the inside, with, this is the concept design stage and the competition stage, that shows no column inside, big open departure floor plan, arrival floor plan below, so the fit out in there, if you walk to the site now, it's just a concrete shell, just a concrete floor. We just received a tender document for the interior fit out. Guess when the opening day is, the end of this year. So you're talking about only six months to go, not only to get the fit out done, but also get it operational ready. So in other words, you can say clients in China are naive, but yet, that is the pressure they are under and therefore those pressures are added on to the architect. The other competition we just finished last year, but we didn't win, we came second, is the Beijing International Airport. This is even a more frightening project, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm lucky not to win it. Because <laughs> the whoever won this contract, <laughs> he's having a lot of problems right now. <laughs> this project is 500,000 square meters in area and in fact it's actually bigger, it's 575,000 square meters, almost the same size as Hong Kong Airport. Hong Kong Airport has six years from design to completion. This project has four. It has to be finished before the Olympics. The terminal, although it's all new, this is the existing Beijing Airport, that's the existing Terminal 2, that's the existing Terminal 1, the existing West Runway, East Runway, they're building the third runway, and the new terminal will be located in between the existing and the new runway in the center line. The new terminal, although it's 575,000 square meters, similar to Hong Kong, but it, the number of stands you have is 76 contact stands. Now, in airport design terms, the size of buildings dictated by the number of stands, because aircraft wings are standards. And so when you park aircraft, wing tip to wing tip, nose to tail. That determined the perimeter of your terminal size. So Hong Kong, although same area, it has only 45 contact stands. This has 76 contact stands. So the planning of the shape of the building is quite ingenious that you have to fit in a lot more aircraft within the same perimeter or area size uh, as the airport in Hong Kong. But the terminal will be located in the middle and because the city is only 25 kilometers from the airport, the city is going to build a new transportation system, a railway, to connect the city center to the inside of the terminal. And it's not only going to go to Terminal 3, it's also going to go to serve Terminal 2 and Terminal 1. So our design basically brings the, the mass transit system right into the terminal center so that the departure and the arrival can actually use the railway station in the middle of it. But this train then dive down inside the building, but in the green space, drive all the way around and go round to terminal one and two. The whole idea is that the, the, the terminal system, terminal three, terminal two, and terminal one, are connected and integrated as a single terminal system. But the transportation, as it come into the build building, from town, the train is split in two levels. Air departure, meaning all the passengers on the train are departing passengers on the aeroplane, will come in at a higher level so that when they get off the train, they are already on the right level as the check-in hall. And then the train will pull out and go on to Terminal 2, and when it comes back, it will come back to Terminal 3 on the lower level, and it will then pick up all the arriving passengers. So the train changes level, the passengers don't have to. So that as passengers, you walk straight out from your departure hall on the same level, whether you are domestic or international, 
and when you come back, you are on the lower level and you walk straight onto the train without any level change. The whole idea is all built on making transportation much more friendly to use and also making the environment that you use as an airport much better than, say, Heathrow, Gatwick, and all those airports that you're used to. Green spaces are no longer just becomes a window dressing. They are actually part of the concourse system so that the people mover system that takes you from the terminal to the satellite actually passes through the garden. And these gardens are designed to be a series of Chinese gardens so that when you are journeying from terminal to satellite or arriving in Beijing from elsewhere, you are always experiencing different kind of landscape, whether it is in springtime, summer, autumn, or winter. So the idea is that the green space is very much part of the terminal building space. But that green space is not only just a con concept as landscape. It is also a way of making a terminal building of the 21st century uh, a much more green or environmentally friendly kind of structure. The roof of the building actually uses the curvature to ventilate. Hot air always rises. The sun always heats the top of the roof. So therefore, the temperature on the roof zone is always higher than the concourse zone. And because there are temperature differences, the density changes, if you let that air out, out of the roof, it will pull the cooler air, which has a lower density, from the, uh, from the lower zone through the green landscape garden to serve the upper floor. So it is, an in, it is a suggestion to the airport authority that airports don't have to be great big machines that consume a lot of energy. It can also be designed to be an environmentally friendly building, quite unlike most airports. So when you come to the winter time, the building responds in a different way. All the roofing panels shut down so that the heat will be trapped inside the cavity between the inner panel and the outer panel. Beijing is a, has a very unique climate. It has a very distinctive four seasons. And during the winter time, you always get clear blue sky. Even though Beijing tends to be very polluted during most of the year, but winter always get crisp air. So the kind of solar heat you get in the winter is actually quite phenomenal. So therefore, the heated air will keep a hot air layer floating in space. And so therefore, your heated floor never get escaped beyond your four and a half to five meters of zone that people actually use. So therefore, the energy system as the equation can actually become a much more uh, less consumed uh, energy is less, less than uh, a typical airport. This kind of idea is not new, but use putting it into a, into a very large airport project is, is quite is untested. But the theory is applicable. The idea of creating green spaces in the front of the building as the lung of the terminal is also a very important point. In Beijing, it's now becoming more and more popular to use geothermal cooling. And one of the projects that we are currently working, which I'm show, I'll show you in a minute, uses the technology of using groundwater and also using earth mass for cooling. Fresh air is drawn from the garden and the green space outside the terminal, and it will be ducted through, and this becomes a cool air channel. And when the hot air in the roof draws, it will draw naturally these cooler air from the green spaces. The water you see are not natural ponds. They are actually part of the cooling system of the air conditioning. Although you don't use the water per se, you're only using the water as a medium to exchange heat. But the idea is that you use the environment to naturally breathe. Therefore, the building responds much more naturally to the weather changes. Environmental design has always been the, uh, the core of the, uh, our company. Although we are relatively young as a company, set up only five years ago, but all the projects we do have the same, carry the same theme and the same passion to make environment design a core of the, the concept. This is a primary and secondary school project 
we, we are currently completing contract documents, which will be built by the year 2006. The site is very unique in Hong Kong, quite unlike most schools. This is right by the sea on an island which there is no access to cars. All the developments surrounding it are low density. It has hills to the north, sea to the south. From a feng shui point of view, it's perfect. But feng shui in this case is not about superstition. It's about natural air movements, cooling, heating, draining, and water protection and weather protection. Our idea is to turn upside down what a standard school design is in Hong Kong. Because these schools are government funded, normally in Hong Kong you apply the government rules and you basically ma massage the plan to fit the site. But the design of the school is standardized. It's what they call standard school design. We thought this would be a real disaster if we do that for this site because the site is so unique. And if you adopt a standard school design for an urban situation and pu put it in a, a rural situation like this, it's not going to do anybody any favor. So we thought if you put and lower the building in as mass so that the traditional play, playground is not only sitting under the building in the stilt, stilted structure, but also in many different layers, including the roof of the building, then not only your children, your school children, have playground at every level of the school, and, but also make it much more environmentally uh, interesting. In order to create a school with a public access, this is a, a performance art center and a, a, a very a, a international size a sports hall and a swimming pool on the roof. In order to allow the community to use the school, the school has to be designed with access. Uh, that separate privacy between public accessible area and the private teaching area. And so therefore, there's a courtyard in which it's almost like a three-dimensional theater for students to display their work. And for most, um, the, because of the weather condition in Hong Kong, when you have a, a courtyard like that, they tend to be too narrow and too small to naturally ventilate because the wall made up by the classrooms on both sides, prevent any air moving through the building. So the only way you can create a natural ventilation is to create temperature difference between the top and the bottom. Now, ambient temperature is different from radiant temperature. So therefore, natural ventilation is not possible, natural way. You have to induce it. So what we've done is to create a canopy. The canopy has a very particular function. Not only does it stop the water coming in, making all the terraces within the school are um, usable all year round, but also it has to deflect radiant heat, but allow daylight to penetrate. Now, daylight penetration is important to sustain plant growth because if you can't have the amount of UV light, trees just don't grow, they die. So therefore, the material you can, on you can have is ETFE. It's the only material we can come across that will meet the budget, is relatively lightweight, very low maintenance, is Teflon, so that it doesn't actually require any cleaning. And the, because it is inflated and it has, a, it has a air insulation, the amount of temperature or insulation you actually can get rid of from the sun is phenomenal. But it let in 94% of the light coming through into the courtyard. So when you are looking from inside, you get almost as if you are in the outdoor space. But because these courtyards have trees and cloisters with tree uh, plant in it, it still allows the amount of uh, daylight to sustain plant life. So therefore, this school is unusual in the sense that it actually designed from an environmental point of view. And it is because of that the school got very excited. The budget went overboard, which is another sad story. But because it has all these environmental issues, the school body now has a lot of sponsorship from other places to provide the additional fund to build a school which normally impossible to realize using the government fund. So therefore, as an architect, you've got to push your boat out because if you don't, nobody will help you. And by pushing the boat out, you sometimes will be surprised how many people are on your side. And only until then, 
your dreams will never come true. So when we are talking about projects in Beijing, everybody thought environmental friendliness, forget it. In China, nobody cares. It's not true, not anymore. It is now the very key thing that determines a development from going ahead or not going ahead. This is uh, the last project I'm going to show you, which is currently the most exciting project we have on our drawing board. The commission came uh, about two years ago. It took us a long time to get to where, where you see this model. The building is in the middle of Beijing. This is Dong Da Chiao Lu, which is on the north-south axis. And it is in the middle of a residential area. And on just behind this wall is the embassy area. So it's all low density, all low rises. The highest building is about seven story high, which is to the southwest corner and to the northwest corner. The reason why you see this building, this shape, is not because the architecturally architects willfully wanted to do a building of that shape. It is entirely shaped by planning law. Now, this takes a lot of explanation. If this is the Grand Plain, and your neighboring building is a residential building, your building sits south or east to that neighboring residential, you have to provide daylight to him. And that daylight in Beijing is one hour on winter solstice days, which is at 26 degree. And two days before Chinese New Year, they call uh, large winter, uh, it's two hours daylight on that day, and the, and the degree is 31 and a half degree. So therefore, when you are looking at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a development like that, your governing point is how much daylight you don't block the, uh, your, your neighbor. Is there any way I can get this to work? Uh, ah, OK. Um, so, the, um, so the shape of the building, although it's not determined by the sun angle, is determined by the daylight you block on your neighbor window. And there is a very sophisticated software that you can calculate how many minutes of daylight you're actually blocking your neighbors, window by window. When, this, when, when the client bought the site, he thought he can build on this site 200,000 square meters. And the governing criteria is that above ground, that line, you are only allow 120,000 square meters. So anything below the ground level, you can build as much as you like, up to 200,000 square meters. Now, when the client was considering buying the site, he thought, oh, this is no problem. Easily, I can build 200,000 square meters. Until we found out that the daylight angle is so severe, you actually cannot build right up to the height limit of 76, because the 200,000 square meter mean you're building a full rectangular block occupying the whole site. Then you make your investment of 200,000 square meter. If you have to shave a corner of your development off, you lose about 50,000 square meter out of the total equation. The client bought the site, but he didn't realize he can't actually build that much. It was at a point whether the client is deciding, Christ, I make a bad investment. They call us in, ask us, is there any way we can do something with that? And we thought, you've got only two ways. You ignore the planning law, you build to the maximum, and you pay your neighbor's compensation, window by window. Or you respect the planning law, you design it within the environment that you are given, and find an alternative way of building a building that will give you 200,000 square meter with a, within a smaller envelope. That's the challenge we had two years ago. And the result is to build conventional office building in four separate blocks, encased by an environmental envelope, therefore using all the spaces traditionally unusable between gaps of buildings. Traditionally, spaces between buildings only is valuable at ground and up to three level high, what we normally call podium. But in an office building, once you go beyond that point, those spaces are useless. 
So therefore, you can never get your 200,000 square meters of development. The other point is that below ground level normally is considered useless space. But if you excavate a hole around the whole site and you sink your building down, therefore creating a, a moat of landscape 24 and 28 meters to the north and to the east and to the west, you have normal daylight for all the offices below street level because 24 meters are almost like a street. I mean, Hong Kong typically a street is only 15 meter wide. So therefore, not only do you get all your development potential realized, you also make the project feasible and therefore environmentally, how do you make use of that space? If you look at the planning, the building block is actually made out of four separate buildings. The blue ones are the taller tower, 20 story high. The red ones are the lower tower, nine story high. In between, 24 meters of atrium, L-shaped wrap around, so that windows on this office and windows on that office looks into an atrium space, almost as if it is a street. All the gardens spread between the buildings. All the gardens on the rooftop becomes terraces. And the whole building is encased within one envelope so that it's almost like building a model case sitting over the four blocks. And because of this envelope, all the spaces between buildings are now become enclosed, weather protected. So the question is, is it feasible to build a building like that in terms of energy, environment, and usability. We took the client to see a number of buildings in Europe. And the idea is that you use the spaces in between buildings as garden space. Now, sky garden is a very, very, very well-used well term. But in reality, sky garden being on an upper level has to be really something that work and not just a decorative part of, this, of the building. The garden in the atrium between the, 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 the two tower are all are on even number floors. The garden on the front of the tower are on odd number floors. So that every floor in an office building has a garden somewhere, whether it is in the middle, in the southwest corner, southeast corner, but every floor has a garden. The idea is that offices are no longer bound by the curtain wall that the building is enclosed. We are now working for another client, um, who is a, which is also a, an IT company. They are pushing what we call office without boundaries. It is an idea that working spaces are no longer only serviceable within a building, within the four walls of a building laptops, infrared, uh, infrared uh, sensors, Bluetooth, allow you to work anywhere within the building so long as it's the sensors can read it. So therefore, the green spaces are extensions of the offices. Now, from a commercial point of view, those green spaces normally are rent-free. But if the green spaces have cafes, snack bars, bars, they are not rent-free. So in other words, the spaces between the building is rentable spaces. So when we last calculated our design, not only are we achieving 200,000 square meter, we are actually achieving 250,000 square meter. So that 50,000 square meter is free to the client. So therefore, not only making his development possible, it's actually making his development verifiable because the, his neighboring development, which is the central business district, have a million square foot coming up next year. He cannot compete because the location, the size of the building doesn't have the same corporate feel, but it does have a different kind of corporate language that is green, sustainable, and therefore marketable. And from, from, from his point of view, green does pay. Now, yesterday we had a conversation, very interestingly, arguing that client never buy such things. They do if you can convince him in the right way. 
So how do you convince him that environmentally does work? Well, we use very simple explanation. He plays golf. If you sit in the golf ground under the sun with air moving through, you feel hot. So why do you get your tech caddy to hold up an umbrella or you sit under the tree? It's only because the radiant heat that come from the sun give you some cooling effect because it's blocked. But the ambient temperature, the air, the air speed, the humidity is the same. So therefore, the comfort level you feel is only because you don't receive any radiant heat. So when we were asked to prove our point, because up to that moment in time, we're only working on our own. We are, we are architects, we're not engineers. So we, when we have been asked to prove our point, we can only use our own judgment. So we employ uh, ARA, uh, Special Engine Advanced Engineering Group, to study the air flows, the temperature gradient, and really proves everything we have instinctively in our head that will work is exactly working the way we thought. The building acts as a very big engine. When the sun heats the glass shell, the air is so hot, it rises very quickly. If you let that air out like a chimney on the top, the amount of force you generate you draw a lot of the air from anywhere you want that air to come in. By digging a hole in the ground, sinking the building, you create shaded space on the north and on the west side. You draw the air from the cooler side and you put water where you draw the air from to create some sort of evaporation and cooling. Because Beijing weather is very dry, whether it is summer or in the winter, the humidity is very low. So creating some sort of water in the air actually makes space a lot more comfortable. The sky garden, you have to maintain the trees. The trees doesn't sustain just by watering it at the roots. You have to mist the leaves. The water you spray on the leaves carried by the air becomes the main cooling factor. All the air conditioning system within the office building is standard air conditioning system. You cool the building during, win uh, during winter time. Sorry, this is winter time. Uh, when we are des designing the, uh, this, the system, the uh, outdoor temperature we use is minus 12. The office temperature is 20 because you're heating it. You reject some of the heat and you dump it into the garden. The garden temperature on average is 14 degrees. It is cold, but it is not as cold as outside at minus 12. But the most interesting thing is during summer. In the summertime, when the outdoor temperature average 33 degrees, the cooling system in the office building is 23. You reject some of the cooling into the garden space. It brings down the average temperature in the atrium down to 30. But at the very top of this apex, the temperature is 57 degrees. But there is no people, people there, so it doesn't really matter. But as soon as you let the hot air out, the cool air re replaces it, and you draw the air where you want them to, to come through, and therefore you create the cooling draft right the way through the building. The most interesting thing is that because the building is designed 36 meters deep with a core in the center, Traditionally, you never get cross ventilation across a 36 meter deep space or even a 12 meter deep space. So we have to create wind chimney in the center core of the building so that some of the hot air can actually leak through the core of the building so that the office is actually cross ventilated during spring and autumn time. Now, you argue that this is very expensive. It does sound very expensive. It is 30% more than a conventional office building because you're building a lot of skins. But because you have 50% of the time of the year that you don't use energy to cool, we calculated that the payback period is about four years. Now, this is a bit too hopeful, and this is how we sell to the client. But I, I'm sure actually it will take more, but nevertheless, he only remembered four years. That's good enough. <laughs> So when we are, when this is a model we, we finished for uh, preliminary design. Uh, this is a model we built uh, one to 200 scale and to illustrate to the city planner the different facilities within the building. The, uh, the glass enclosure and the two buildings are primarily offices on the east elevation. 
It has a six-star hotel uh, in the upper block. Each of the hotel room is 72 square meter room size. I mean, it's bigger than most flat in Hong Kong. And every room either has a pool or has a garden in itself. The hotel rooms have roof terraces, so therefore some rooms are very special indeed. But the offices down below, on the south elevation, is conventional. In other words, these are all double window, uh, double glaze cladding system with office at 12 meter unit bay. Some offices have terraces outside, so they are private terraces. Some offices have garden on their own floor and some offices have bridges as sky garden hanging outside. But not only is it just office and hotel, it has a health club on the roof of the low block. There's a swimming pool here, 72 meter long, a shopping mall, 30,000 square meters of it down at the bottom. And to the, if you look diagonally, where the access, pedestrian access, taken from the main street to, the, uh, to a park on the opposite diagonal corner, there's a footbridge, which is 90 meter clear span. So when you take the model and you split it open, this is what you see in the footbridge, allowing, taking people on the street level across the building, create one scene. And upper floor, there's a bar hanging in the sky, bridging between two buildings and there is a restaurant on the top hanging between the structure create the bubble which is on the very top but the garden spaces green spaces perpetrate through the entire building volume and this is what it looks like as a perspective um, hopefully it will look like that but we are still working on the cladding system to reduce the amount of structure in the cladding but the uh, the building is very much concrete structure, very conventionally built, so that you put your money on the outside rather than on the inside of the structural system. So when Justina asked me to talk about dim sum city, I thought, well, what is the relevance to what we are doing? Well, there is a lot of relevance. The conservation of energy and how do you use heat source um, to heat all the different kind of food within a minimal amount of space, is his order, which is what designer is all about. You have to be creative, you have to be able to use resources, and you also have to allow the customers the satisfaction that he wants something quick. So therefore, speed, satisfaction is all about working in Asia. It's very challenging, but nevertheless, it's also very, very difficult at times. Thank you. Great, what a presentation. Um, now, uh, it's time for the forum. Can we call all the people who are going to be part of the forum to come, in, to, come to the front? Uh, Robert Powell. Uh, Moisen, um, Shu Casey here, Paul Hyatt, 